This is Physical Science 2, Chapter 7, Part 3 on the Sun, Moon, Earth System. In this portion of the video lecture, we will be discussing characteristics of the moon. The moon is our only satellite uh, that orbits the planet. Um, the moon's rotation and revolution are uh, very unique. Um, it takes 27.3 days for one moon revolution. So that means that it takes 27.3 days for the moon to go around the Earth one time. Uh, the complete lunar phase cycle. So in other words, when the moon goes from a new moon phase to a new moon phase, that takes about 30 days. This is why our calendar is lunar based. There are 12 months in a year because during a year on Earth, the moon goes through uh, its complete phase cycle in about 30 days. Now, just like it takes 27.3 days for the moon to go around the Earth, it also takes 27.3 days for the moon to rotate once around. So what this means is that we only see the same side of the moon from the Earth's surface all of the time because it rotates at the same rate as it revolves. So we keep seeing the same side of the moon all of the time. Because the moon is our closest neighbor in space, uh, it does uh, have some effects here on Earth as well. Uh, the tides are gravitational pulls of both the sun and the moon um, that create waves here on Earth through the ocean uh, in a very timed sort of manner. So we have the rise of the sea level, of course. We consider that high tide. Uh, and approximately six hours later, the sea level will drop uh, in a low tide. Now the water is, what's happening to the water in this uh, particular high tide, low tide scenario? This is uh, a picture of the same pier uh, at high tide and at low tide. So one may think, well, where does the, where does the water go? Uh, the water is actually traveling in a swell uh, or a bubble, if you will, that kind of follows the moon around. Again, remember, gravity, the two things that we have to deal with is mass and distance. The moon, astronomically speaking, is fairly close to the Earth and has a rather large mass. So the water on the surface of the Earth is attracted to the moon. And so that's why the sea level rises and drops. The water isn't draining anywhere. It's not being stored somewhere. Uh, it's, it's all... All of the water is still in the ocean. It's just a matter of if it's at a high tide, that means that that gravitational pull is at its strongest. When it's at the low tide, it's at its weakest. Now, because the sun is also a very large object that's rather close to us as well, it affects our tides. But the moon has a greater effect on tides than the sun because it is so close to the earth. So when the moon and the sun uh, line up together, uh, we can form kind of an extreme high tide and an extreme low tide. We call those spring tides, uh, generally because in uh, the northern hemisphere, these tend to happen in the springtime. Now when the sun and the moon are kind of playing tug of war and they're kind of... Uh, they're at right angles to each other. We get very weak high and very weak low tides. Uh, we call those tides neap tides. So here we have the positions of the sun and the moon and the earth uh, at a spring tide, which is on the top. So the sun and the moon are tugging together. There's that tidal bulge with the water. So that's where we're going to have extreme high and low tides of spring tides. And then on the bottom, that's where they're at right angles. We got a little kind of tug of war going on. And so then we have some weaker 
high and low tides in the form of neap tides. Uh, because of the positions of the sun and the moon and the earth, uh, we see the moon phases or the changing appearance of the moon throughout its lunar cycle, which remember lasts about 30 days. So we will quickly go through the phases of the moon. We will go from this, the new moon, uh, all the way back to the new moon through the cycle. So a new moon is when the moon is between the earth and the sun and it's not visible to our view. However, it is still there. Uh, if you have a really nice telescope, uh, even on nights where it is a new moon, you can see the very back um, part of the moon being shadowed. Uh, this is the portion that we cannot observe from Earth because remember, the revolution and rotation of the moon are the same. So we always see the same side of the moon when it faces Earth. So when the, uh, the light is being blocked, we call it a new moon. So now we'll go through the waxing phases of the moon. Waxing means that the lighted portion is going to appear larger and larger each night. Each one of these phases lasts about five to seven days. Uh, so the waxing crescent is the first phase that we see after a new moon. So the light for the moon will come from the east side of the moon. In the first quarter, uh, it seems a little odd to say this, uh, and don't tell the math teachers I did, but a good way that I remembered this uh, is that the first quarter moon is half lit up. Uh, so a quarter is a half, which is not really proportional at all, but the reason why they call this phase the first quarter is because you're one-fourth of the way through all of the phases. So in the first quarter, the east half of the moon is lit. About five to seven days later, we get what's called the waxing gibbous. Now, gibbous is a funny name, uh, and this is kind of a funny, awkward phase for the moon because it's not quite a, a full moon yet. Uh, we'll say it's about a good east three-quarters of the moon is lit in a waxing gibbous. Then, of course, the full moon is where we have full light on the side of the moon facing the Earth. Then, about five to seven days later, we will go into what are called the waning phases. So, in waning phases, the lighted moon, portion of the moon is going to appear smaller each night. So, the light will disappear from the east side of the moon. So, after a full moon, we have another kind of funny, awkward phase, uh, the waning gibbous. So the waning gibbous is when the west three quarters of the moon is lit. Then we hit the third quarter because we're three quarters of the way through the whole cycle. But remember, in third quarter, now we're going to see the west half of the moon being lit. And then finally, we will have the waning crescent. So that's the last phase that we see before the new moon. So here we have the whole thing in order. Remember, the sunlight is always going to come from the east. Uh, so we have the new moon through the waxing crescent, first quarter, waxing gibbous, full, waning gibbous, third quarter, and then the waning crescent. Now again, because of the positions of the sun and the moon and the earth, sometimes uh, we get to see some rather uh, interesting phenomena. A solar eclipse is when the moon moves directly between the earth and the sun. Uh, so it's kind of blocking the sunlight, if you will. So in an eclipse, we call the area of total eclipse, or the darkest part of the shadow, the umbra. And in the area of a partial eclipse, uh, we call the penumbra. Uh, solar eclipses are rarely seen uh, because you have to be in the umbra or at least the penumbra to even observe or even notice that uh, a solar eclipse is going on. If you are outside of those areas, it will just look like a regular normal day. Lunar eclipses, on the other hand, are more common. Um, this is when the Earth's shadow falls on the moon. So in this case of a lunar eclipse, we are blocking the sunlight from the moon. 
In a total eclipse, the moon is completely inside the Earth's umbra. And in a partial eclipse, the moon can partially be in either the umbra or the penumbra. In a partial lunar eclipse, you tend to see kind of a reddish, orangish kind of glow to the moon. Uh, and that is because of the diffraction of light, uh, kind of spreads it out. And in a total lunar eclipse, it would be a more black and white sort of shadow. Let's talk about some characteristics of the surface. Uh, when we observe the moon, we can see a bunch of holes and, and pits. These craters are caused by impacts uh, from meteorites, asteroids, comets, all of this space junk uh, that floats around. Um, the moon is fairly vulnerable because it is meteorologically dead, so it has no weather. So there is no atmosphere to protect it. Uh, it is also geologically dead, so the moon uh, is, is a solid mass uh, and there's no internal heat going on anymore. So these impact craters, some of them have been formed millions of years ago, and because there is no weather on the moon, there is no weathering. So we see the moon's surface uh, as it has been for, for many, many, many uh, thousands of years. The maria on the moon. Um, this stems from the uh, Latin word meaning marine. Uh, Galileo, when he took a look at the moon through a telescope, thought that these maria were old uh, ocean beds that had somehow become drained. Um, we know that these are, are lava plains uh, from the Earth's or from the moon's early geologic history, for, for lack of a, a better word. Um, the interior of the, of the moon is no longer active, but these uh, ancient lava plains show that there was activity at some time. The light parts of the moon is the regolith. Uh, the regolith is kind of like the soil or the dust, dirt of the moon. Uh, it's accumulation from debris from uh, all of the impacts, uh, and it reflects light very well. The interior of the moon, uh, as far as we know, um, the moon's crust is a little bit thinner on the side of the Earth than it is on its opposite side. And that is because, remember, we always see the same side of the moon because its rotation and revolution are the same. So as the moon formed and was cooling, because it was constantly being tugged on one side of, of the moon, we have kind of a thin crust on the Earth side and kind of a thick crust on the outside. From those maria, we know that lava once flowed on the moon's surface, uh, but now it's completely solid. Exploring the moon. Uh, we may go back up there again someday. Uh, we've had lots of missions, manned and unmanned, uh, and we will uh, talk about some of these and have some activities covering these as well. So where did we get the moon? Um, there's been some theories. Um, some older theories, the capture theory, of course, would say that, you know, the moon was zipping by the Earth one day and got captured in its gravitational field. Binary accretion. Uh, this is basically saying that the Earth and the moon were formed at the same time. That's bi means two. Uh, and fission uh, is where kind of a, a theory where the Earth sort of kind of birthed the moon, uh, that there was a, a glob of molten material that escaped and then that became our moon. However, the most widely accepted theory of moon origin is what we call the giant impact theory. Uh, so about 4.6 billion years ago, a very large object, more likely uh, probably about the size of Mars, uh, was an ancient planet uh, that we're going to call Thea, uh, collided with Earth. And the gas and debris were thrown into the orbit. And all of this debris kind of condensed due to gravity and formed a large mass uh, to form our moon, which we have a name for the moon. We call it Luna. This has been Physical Science 2, Chapter 7, Part 3 on the Sun-Moon-Earth System.